Good morning. I hope everybody can hear me. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so you are here for the uh, Fly Agaric panel, and this is Fly Agaric, the Misunderstood Magic Mushroom. Um, <clears throat> so on the panel today, we have three panelists who I will introduce shortly, and we'll be covering the uh, pharmacology of the Fly Agaric, um, some of its therapeutic potential, as well as uh, archaeological evidence uh, for its use in the past. Um, so one of the reasons this is named uh, the misunderstood magic mushroom is that this is a, a largely, well, frankly, a misunderstood and, and also overlooked. Um, so we hear a lot about uh, psilocybin mushrooms and uh, about the therapeutic potential uh, of psilocybin and there are active trials going on uh, using psilocybin. Um, but uh, fly agaric also has therapeutic potential. Um, and fly agaric has also traditionally been seen as kind of a, a secondary or less than uh, magic mushroom. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, one, I use the term uh, magic because it is not uh, precisely a, a psychedelic mushroom. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, with our first pr presentation, which will go over the uh, pharmacology and also when I talk a little bit about the uh, therapeutic use of this mushroom. Um, and there's a lot of misperceptions of the fly agaric as being a, a poison or a potentially deadly mushroom. And this continues to be, um, the mushroom continues to be described this way in, in mushroom field guides uh, and in other areas. So there's lots of, of misinformation uh, that continues to be shared about this mushroom. Um, so these will be some of the things that we, we hope to uh, enlighten everybody about. And uh, we're very excited to be able to share this panel. Um, I've been uh, at a number of psychedelic and sacred plant conferences over the years, and the fly garrick is almost never addressed uh, unless I'm addressing it myself. So there's a lot of invisibility uh, of this mushroom within uh, the field of, of psychedelics research and research on sacred plants. So we hope to uh, maybe change that today uh, with this presentation, uh, shine some light on this and, and create interest in, in something that I think we all feel uh, has been overlooked. Um, so with that out of the way, I, I want to uh, briefly introduce uh, our speakers and we'll each go through our separate presentations and we will have uh, questions and answers at the end. Uh, as you'll notice, you've, uh, this probably isn't your first session at the conference, but there is a uh, Q&A um, chat section to the right of your screen. So if you do have questions, please type those there uh, and I'll be uh, monitoring those through the talks. Okay, so today we have three speakers. Um, we have uh, Eva Machicek, and she is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Biotechnology and Food Sciences at Lodz University of Technology in Poland. She received her PhD from the University of Opol, Poland, where she conducted research on the isolation and identification of bioactive molecules from hallucinogenic mushrooms. Her research interests are focused on the isolation of natural products their effect on skin and on potential applications in cosmetic products. Also joining us in our panel today uh, is Giorgio Samarini, and he is an independent researcher specializing in the ethnobotany of psychoactive plants and mushrooms with an emphasis on the archaeoethnobotany and archaeoethnomycology of psychoactive sources. Giorgio is the author of several books including Archaeology of Intoxicant Plants, and personally documented the oldest archaeological evidence for the use of psychoactive mushrooms in the Sahara Desert. He has also studied the Witte religion of the Bantus and Gabon, 
where the hallucinogenic plant iboga is used as a sacrament, as well as the problem of the origins of ayahuasca, uh, which so far lacks credible archeological documentation. My name is Kevin Feeney. I will be the monitor, uh, the moderator, excuse me, uh, for this panel. I am a cultural anthropologist and lawyer currently working as a program director and instructor uh, in interdisciplinary studies at Central Washington University. My primary research interests include examining legal and regulatory issues surrounding the religious and cultural uses of psychoactive substances with an emphasis on peyote and ayahuasca, and also exploring modern and traditional uses of Ammonita muscaria, which is a scientific name for the fly agaric. And uh, with that, uh, on that mushroom, a specific focus on its uh, medicinal use and also on preparation practices. I am currently a member of Shakruna's Council for the Protection of Sacred Plants and recently joined the Board of Advisors for Psyched Wellness, a Canadian health supplements company emphasizing medicinal mushrooms. And uh, before we get started, I also wanted to share that uh, the three panelists today are all contributors uh, to a recent volume on the fly agaric, uh, which is this. It's fly agaric, uh, a compendium of history, pharmacology, uh, mythology, and exploration, uh, which came out last year. So each of us has chapters uh, in this volume. So I believe, uh, we're still waiting uh, for Eva, and let me check on her. Okay, here we go. Oops. There we go. Uh, good morning or, or good evening. Uh, for me, it's good evening. <laughs> so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for kind invitation. Very good. Well, I will uh, hand over the reins to you and um, let me know if you need help uh, getting the slides going and we'll make sure that those uh, get set up. Okay, I will try to uh, to share with you my, my presentation. I'll wait for a moment. Okay, perfect. And if you need something, I'm going to leave the screen here, uh, but you can talk to me and I will uh, okay. uh, shoot uh, behind the scenes. So please give me a second. Okay. So I guess this is, okay, mm -hmm. so please let me know if it is visible. Can you see it? Yes, it looks good. I think you're ready to go. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, so uh, as it was already said, uh, today I'm going to give you some information on the pharmacology of the fly agaric. agaric. And uh, um, I will uh, start with uh, the main psychoactive compounds, which mean uh, muscimol and ibotenic acid. Then I will go to Manitol with this uh, uh, possible role in, in the mushroom hallucinogenic properties. Uh, another compounds which I'm going to talk about are beta-D-glucan and fucamanogalactan with uh, antineceptive and anti-inflammatory potential. Uh, and Amanita muscaria is uh, also um, considered a promising source of provitamin pro D and also uh, vitamin D itself. Uh, so, uh, as a chemist, uh, 
I'm uh, interested in chemical composition of any species which I'm dealing with. Uh, it is also important to understand what active pharmacological constituents of a plant or a fungi are. So, uh, also uh, how they work uh, within the human body. Uh, and mushrooms from the genus Amanita contain numerous compounds of pharmacological interest, including muscarin that gave the name uh, to uh, muscarinic uh, acetylcholine receptors, uh, the isoxazole, muscimol, and ibotenic acid, uh, which are presented uh, here. Um, were isol isolated from Amanita muscaria by several groups uh, in early 1960s. Uh, these mushrooms are uh, psychoactive and uh, have a rich history, and muscimol is considered to contribute uh, significantly to their behavioral effects. Addition of the structures of muscimo and ibotenic acid uh, by Professor Exter in uh, 1976 showed their clear structural resemblance to mammalian neurotransmitter GABA and glutamic acid, respectively. Uh, further experiments show that they indeed act like GABA and glutamic uh, acid when applied to uh, spinal uh, uh, cords. Uh, further experiments show that uh, Mosimo was a potent GABA and uh, at the percent of the firing of uh, spinal neurons. And this action was not antagonized by uh, strychnine and uh, an antagonist of the spinal inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter glycine. Uh, this research concluded that uh, with respect to its central action, Mustimul is apparently GABA-like amino acid uh, as antiseptic uh, structural grounds. Uh, when GABA antagonist uh, bicacoline became available, the same research group showed that Musimo was also uh, antagonized by this agent. And Musimo uh, is a conformationally restricted analog of GABA, uh, in which uh, the uh, three hydroxy isoxazole moiety acts as a mask carbonyl group in GABA. Uh, as far as certain GABA receptors are concerned, it looks like the carboxyl group of GABA, while other macromolecules... Uh, the conformational restriction comes both from the incorporation of a double bond into the GABA backbone, um, and... Um, There are two uh, types of uh, GABA receptors found in the central nervous system based on uh, their mechanism of action. Ionotropic receptors are GABA-gated uh, chloride ion channels, while metabotropic receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. Uh, on the basis of their pharmacology, Ionotropic receptors may be divided uh, into two subclasses. GABA-A receptors are antagonized by bicuculine with GABA-C receptors are antagonized by uh, TPMPA. Uh, and metabotropic GABA receptors are classified as GABA-B receptors that are activated by uh, baclofen and are uh, insensitive to bicuculine and TPMPA, uh, and also uh, Mustimo doesn't act on that uh, uh, receptors. We know that uh, Mustimo is a potent uh, agonist at GABA A receptors, a potent partial agonist at GABA C receptors, and inactive 
at GABA B. Uh, these findings reflect on Mosimo several potential therapeutic applications. Some research shown uh, that uh, the incidence of uh, gastric uh, cancers in rats artificially uh, induced with gastric ca carcinogenesis uh, is reduced by prolonged Mosimo treatment. Another study found that injection of Mosimo into the rat's spinal cord significantly reduced the uh, le level of uh, neuropathic pain. Although observed effects were short and decreased after three hours, and other research showed that Mosimo injection into the uh, body cavity uh, also in rats gave an anti-anxiety effect of similar strength to that of uh, diazepam. And finally, another study demonstrated that Mosimo seemed to enhance and uh, somehow protect memory uh, by reducing brain uh, inflammation and by reducing uh, rates of uh, acetylcholine metabolism in the brain, as acetylcholine is neurotransmitter enhancing memory, showing its degradation in the brain keeps adequate level of this uh, neurotransmitter. Uh, another worf methionic uh, compound, which may have some connection uh, with, to fly agaric uh, psychoactivity is manitol. It is a sugar metabolite, polyol, which are obtained by substituting an aldehyde group with hydroxyl one. Uh, manitol is a white crystalline substance uh, and along with sorbitol and other polyols, it is a um, characteristical fungal metabolite present also in Amanita muscaria and other fungi. Uh, its high content in mush mushrooms is uh, related uh, to the fact that it has a protective function uh, in the ev event of water and thermal stre stress, especially low temperatures. Uh, this compound uh, is also widely used in medicine uh, in the control of um, elevated in intracranial pre pressure, uh, in the protection of kidneys uh, in various types of transplant uh, and in the treatment of uh, rhabdomyolysis. Uh, furthermore, other research showed interesting properties of manitou to improve delivery of drugs to the human uh, brain, which is connected with the opening the blood-brain barrier. These results inspired uh, mm, me and my uh, supervisor to to um, to the hypothesis that uh, relatively uh, high concentration of manitol in the tissue of uh, fly agaric, which is around one gram manitol per one hundred gram of dry weight. Uh, enables more efficient transportation of ibotenic acid and mustimol into the brain and thus it enhance somehow their hallucinogenic activity. Uh, this hypothesis might explain why uh, the psychoactive effects produced after injection of Amanita muscaria is greater than after uh, injection of uh, an equivalent amount of, uh, of Mustimo. However, other researchers have suggested that this, is, um, this effect may be related to 
other hallucinogenic substance which remain undiscovered still. Other interesting sugar metabolites are polysaccharides. Recently, polysaccharides derived from mushroom have arisen as an important class of bioactive substances. Many medicinal and therapeutic properties are attributed to uh, th this kind of uh, substances, uh, which were found in ba Basidium setes. Uh, Amanita muscaria is not an exception in that. Uh, there, there are a Fukumana galactan and 1,3 and 1,6 uh, linked uh, beta D glucan uh, were also isolated from, uh, from uh, Amanita muscaria and both uh, were evaluated for their anti inflammatory and anti no receptive potential and they uh, produced potent inhibition of inflammatory pain and gluc glucan obtained from uh, from fly agaric also exhibited significant anti-tumor activity against uh, sarcoma in mice And among many different active substances which were separated from, uh, from fly agaric, there are also sterols. Um, in general, they are effective as antiviral, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer substances. Uh, and such properties are also characteristic for ergosterol. Um, although it was first isolated more than 100 years ago. Uh, it is one of the most common fungal uh, sterols and its therapeutic values was recognized during the search for active metabolites of medicinal mushrooms. Uh, for example, um, uh, one ec extracted from Mycelium griffula frondosa uh, containing a mixture of fatty acid and ergosterol and other sterol derivatives showed inhibitory properties uh, toward uh, cyclooxygenases uh, 1 and 2. Other studies report that uh, tumor growth in mice was disrupted with without side effects after oral administration of ergosterol. Uh, Inhibition of uh, new blood vessel formation in uh, some lung cancer was also uh, observed um, after uh, administration of ergosterol. Uh, on the basis of in vivo studies, it was found that uh, the anti-cancer effect of ergosterol is associated with the uh, inhibition of angiogenesis caused by the growing tumor. Uh, but what I would like to emphasize that ergosterol is a precursor of vitamin D2. Uh, this is uh, other kind of uh, uh, isomer. Uh, which is called ergocalciferol. And this vitamin is essential for proper bone development. It is also used in the treatment of skin diseases, uh, mm, secondary hyperparathyroidism, uh, and various types of cancer. Uh, And it is interesting uh, because uh, with uh, mushrooms which uh, you can buy in the uh, in the, in your shop, uh, the uh, amount of vitamin D itself is enhanced by UV radiation just before they put it uh, into the shop. Let's say. Uh, 
And uh, Amanita muscaria um, is a very rich source of ergosterol, uh, it containing uh, even up to 77 um, milligram per gram of dry mass. Uh, for comparison, concentration of this compound in the popular um, edible mushroom, Agaricus bisporus, uh, is more than sixfold lower. So, as a take-home message from my, uh, my presentation, um, I would like you to remember about that um, Mustimo is a selective agonist as, at uh, ionotropic GABA receptors, and as GABA uptake inhibitor, has opened up the way to the discovery of an uh, ever-increasing array of muscimol analogs, which uh, increasingly selective profiles. And you must know that literature on the subject revealed that the pharmacology of Amanita muscaria uh, still remains uh, largely unexplored. Uh, the, uh, this short presentation um, is focused mostly on hallucinogenic compounds and substances with proven activity. Uh, however, there is a, a lack of analysis for the total chemical composition of the fly agaric, uh, which is a mushroom um, which has been used let's say, as a miracle cure uh, for many diseases, uh, as, uh, mm, as you can uh, see in the literature, uh, when uh, you can uh, read about uh, how, for example, uh, shamans use, use that mushrooms in their practice. Okay, so thank you for, for uh, listening. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. Uh, that was uh, wonderful, and, and hopefully we'll have <clears throat> some questions. We'll have opportunity for questions at the end, so hopefully we'll have some questions on, on each of our presentations. Um, so I'll go ahead and get uh, my slides uh, loaded here, and we'll go to the next presentation. Okay. Let me make sure. Okay. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> so I will be talking a little bit about uh, fly agaric as medicine and <clears throat> we'll be relying on, on some of the information uh, just shared uh, by Eva. Um, but this is a mushroom that does have a, a long-standing uh, tradition uh, as a medicine and one that is uh, frequently overlooked. So what is fly agaric? Oh, just to go over some of the basics, uh, this is the classic Ammonita muscaria mushroom, right, with the red cap and, and white spots. Uh, it is a mycorrhizal mushroom, which means it grows in association uh, with the roots of various trees, and this prevents it from being uh, cultivated, so it, it does need to be uh, wild harvested. Um, it's cosmopolitan in the northern hemisphere, uh, obviously, uh, most of us have probably seen it in, in children's books and movies and cartoons. Uh, and this is also a psychoactive mushroom uh, rather than psychedelic in the classical sense and is generally considered poisonous. So it's largely been uh, avoided. However, it has been used medicinally uh, in different parts of the world 
uh, specifically in Eastern Europe, uh, in parts of Russia and Scandinavia and in Siberia. Uh, whereas we see, you know, psilocybin being used to, to treat of psychological disorders and, and things like that, uh, we see kind of a, a broader uh, and in some cases a more practical day-to-day -day, uh, possibilities for use of this mushroom. So traditionally it's been used externally uh, as a poultice, used to treat inflammation and pain associated with rheumatism and joint ailments. Uh, Eva talked a little bit about anti-inflammatory properties of some of the compounds in the mushroom. Uh, a tincture of the mushroom has been used to treat spinal conditions, uh, irritation of spinal cord, neuralgia, and it's also been applied topically to treat bruises and, and sore muscles. So traditionally, um, one of the areas where we see a long-standing tradition, both uh, medicinally and shamanically, is in Siberia. And there are a number of different uh, indigenous groups in that part of the world that have traditions of using this mushroom. So uh, among some of these peoples, the fly agaric is considered a tonic. And a brief description of a tonic is, is a substance that gives a feeling of vigor or well-being. So among the Koryak, uh, particularly among the elders, um, as one finds throughout the world, younger generations often uh, shy away or move away from uh, the traditions of their people, things that are seen as old fashioned. And uh, this is, well, there are many downsides to uh, globalization, but, but this is one of them. And, and this idea that uh, people, young people in particular, strive for uh, modernity and to be part of what they see as a modern uh, global society. Um, unfortunately, this means that we are losing uh, some of this knowledge that's been passed down for generations in, in cultures around the world. Um, so this is used among Koryak elders, uh, energy and alleviate fatigue. Um, there are lots of great quotes um, in the ethnographic literature. Uh, this is one that I picked up. Uh, this individual says, in harvesting hay, I can do the work of three men from morning to nightfall without any trouble. Uh, there are lots of other examples of, of women in Siberia uh, chewing on the dried caps uh, while they are tanning hides or reindeer herders that will chew a little bit of the cap and, and it helps them to keep up with the herd. Uh, and one of the things that's reported is, is that the mushroom gives, in small doses, it gives energy. Um, and, you know, I, I use, I had my cup of coffee this morning uh, to give me some energy. But one of the things they report is that it also makes their activities, mundane activities in particular, more pleasant. Um, and unfortunately, coffee doesn't doesn't necessarily make the mundane more pleasant, but fly agaric uh, does uh, help kind of immerse people uh, in their activities. One of the things really interesting is the use of this mushroom uh, for what I would call courage, and translation of this, right, would be an, an anxiolytic or an anti-anxiety drug. Um, but some of this, the uses we see and uh, one of the observations that is made uh, among Siberians is that they've seen male bears uh, consuming the fly agaric during the rutting season. So oh, as uh, bears are, are competing for mates, uh, Presumably, the, the fly agaric it gives them the, the courage uh, yeah. for that competition. Um, yeah. while, while the fly agaric has properties and, and properties that aid in shamanic journeying, uh, this Sorry. effect or courage giving effect is also important because it gives the shaman the confidence to communicate with spirits 
And I think this is one of the things we don't think of when we talk about uh, the, the shamanic and shamanic work uh, uh, is that these individuals are, are with spirits in the other world. And, and this is not, uh, you know, it's not like putting on a Fantasia Disney movie and, and having this fantasy uh, quite and not all these spirits are are friendly. So oh. this has a kind of a double component, right? It in the also provides the confidence necessary to uh, One of the other uh, things that we see in, in some Siberian cultures is there's a great tradition storytelling, uh, particularly and and accounts of, of ethnographers speaking um, to individuals who were renowned storytellers came across as, as quite uh, in their interactions with the ethnographers. But once they had assumed a little bit of this mushroom, they became very uh, and, and engaging and, and would dive into these you know, complex and colorful stories. Uh, uh, particularly through song. This is an, an interesting facet of the mushroom uh, uh, that, of course, is quite different uh, than we see in, in other substances, um, um, uh, substances that would more psychedelic, where, where anxiety exactly. may be one of the effects. Uh, um, another uh, issue I'd, I like to there is there's this long-standing um, mythology or, or hypothesis that the Viking used the Amanita muscari as uh, put them into the berserker frenzy, uh, which is uh, quite famous. Um, and there's this theory, but I, I think looking at the anti-anxiety effect or the courage giving properties uh, is an important facet to consider uh, in this theory. Uh, of course, if someone is going to be a great warrior, they need to be fearless. And certainly, uh, we can see in the properties of uh, that this is something that it does induce in the mushroom. It's also a long standing. Okay. Uh, there we go. There's also a long-standing tradition of using this mushroom in homeopathy. Uh, it's been used in homeopathy for almost 200 years. Uh, while there are certainly reasons to be skeptical um, about homeopathy, I, I found this to be a, a particularly interesting uh, history uh, mushroom that's not frequently reported. And it has been used in, in a variety of ways uh, that are important uh, and that do speak to its pharmacology, even though homeopathic preparations uh, typically would not have a significant um, amount of the properties uh, or compounds that one would be. But it has been used to treat uh, insomnia, rheumatism, skin conditions, uh, irritable spinal cord, uh, things like that um, that we also see in other traditional applications um, as a topical and also while well used internally. Okay, so I conducted my own on this substance. Uh, I felt like there wasn't a, a lot of good research on, on use of the raw material, the mushroom itself. Uh, so despite the stigma surrounding this mushroom is, as a poisonous mushroom. Uh, there are lots of anecdotal reports online of people using this mushroom therapeutically and successfully. There's also the this history of therapeutic use that I've kind of briefly summarized. And the fact that people are actively researching uh, psilocybin for treatment of cluster headaches, depression, and uh, life anxiety, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and, and other conditions. I, I thought it was interesting that that this mushroom continues to be overlooked. Uh, there are promising uh, 
uh, properties and effects in the primary compounds. And uh, while this is not a true psychedelic, it doesn't act uh, specifically on the serotonergic or dop dopaminergic systems. Uh, it acts through the GABA system in, in the brain. Uh, and that's one of the things that, that gives this uh, a fairly unique effect that sets it apart uh, from other psychoactive substances. So my were who is using this mushroom therapeutically? What are they using it for? Is it effective? How are they using it? Why did they choose this mushroom specifically, particularly given its reputation as a poisonous mushroom? And are the reported therapeutic uses supported uh, by current scientific data? So about this, there we go. Uh, how I went about this is I, I did an online survey and I advertised uh, my survey through online forums, uh, specifically targeting groups and forums that focused on Amnita muscaria, that focused on mushrooms and mycology, or that focused on entheogens and psychedelics. Uh, so this is a fairly targeted um, method. Uh, I was able to get 30 participants, and I also conducted semi-structured interviews uh, with five of those participants, just to get more in-depth information. So the uh, breakdown of individuals who participated, uh, so there were limitations, right? Again, this was a very sort of focused, targeted um, uh, research in terms of collecting participants. So 80% of the participants uh, identified as white. The median and modal age is between 35 and 44. 70% of the respondents were male. 57% had at least a college education. And 60% of the people that participated uh, were Americans uh, by nationality. So uh, it's a fairly uh, specific kind of demographic group that participated in this study. Um, it'd be wonderful to be able to do this again with a, a broader range of people, but uh, one might also expect that there are limits perhaps to the types of people that are interested and experimenting with this mushroom uh, specifically. Okay, so hopefully uh, people can see the chart uh, well enough. Um, I didn't prompt any of the participants to identify specific types of uses. I, I asked the participants to self-identify uh, what they were using this mushroom for. And the primary things uh, that people, they were using it in treatment of addiction, uh, specifically, um, potentially addressing uh, withdrawal symptoms and weaning off of addictive substances um, such as uh, alcohol, opiates, and benzodiazepines. Uh, people were using it for anxiety, uh, to treat depression, um, to treat fatigue. So we talked earlier about in Siberia that this is uh, as a tonic and for energy. is also used to treat insomnia and pain. And the way I've organized this here, you look at the, the top, the purple row is those who reported use. The pink or orange below is those that reported that it was effective. And then the blue is those that redu uh, reported actually reducing medications. So I, I included this last uh, measure because it's one thing for people to subjectively report that something is effective. Um, that can mean anything and that requires a lot of interpretation. But if someone is reporting that they are, in addition to reporting it as effective, also reducing uh, the use of important medications to treat in anxiety or uh, insomnia, things like that, then that is an indicator that there is actually uh, a, some sort of measurable 
uh, effect that is happening here. So I am, um, first of time, I, I'm going to kind of rush through some of these things. I've, I've got some quotes that I want to share, and, and then I, I'm going to want to wrap up because I want to make sure um, that we have, uh, uh, that Giorgio has the he needs for his presentation as well. Um, so on addiction and withdrawal, uh, some of the sub one of the that after 20 years and multiple attempts to quit alcohol, ammonite muscaria was the tool that was able to minimize cravings and mitigate withdrawal symptoms. Another subject said, I found I no longer felt I needed to use a or alcohol. For anxiety, one subject said, I don't need to take benzodiazepines to control panic attacks as often due to having a natural alternative. Another said, uh, extremely effective as a natural benzodiazepine alternative to help alleviate generalized anxiety disorder taken on an as needed basis when anxiety levels are high and needed bringing down to more manageable levels. Uh, it's also important to note that the fly agaric and Compounds are non-addictive, uh, so the fact that somebody is able to reduce their use of an addictive compound by benzodiazepines, like benzodiazepines, uh, I think is is significant and important. Okay. Okay, I'm having some freezing here. In just a minute. Okay, computer is freezing. Okay. Depression, one subject said, uh, first time free of depression, depressive behavior, first time since the age of four, having no suicidal plans whatsoever. Another subject said, I sometimes have to take SSRI medications, usually more so in winter months. Supplementing with amonite helps me to keep the dose of pharma meds low. Okay, and my slides are kind of uh, crapping out on me. Um, but on the topic of insomnia, one of the subjects said, in small doses of chewed and swallowed dried caps, I was able to fall asleep faster and stay asleep longer. It increases my sleep pattern from the typical four to six hours to a full seven to nine hours of what I consider to be good sleep. Another said it has allowed me to avoid over-the-counter uh, medications and help to limit alcohol consumption. Uh, on the topic of pain, one subject said massaging fly agaric ointment into affected areas provided relief and eased tension the following morning. And another said I take less ibuprofen and get fewer massages. So I don't know that I would personally reduce my amount of massages, but it's certainly uh, a way to save money because that's certainly not cheap. And, and one of the things that I was really interested uh, in finding out is about side effects. Uh, Ammonite muscaria does have some unpleasant side effects. Uh, and these side effects can be removed by uh, appropriate preparation techniques. Uh, but there's still a possibility of experiencing these. So side effects typically include uh, maybe some nausea or vomiting uh, or sweating, uh, salivation, and chills. So some of the things that people said about this, uh, one subject said increased perspiration can be an annoyance. However, it is a small price to pay for relief from anxiety. Another said only the perspiration was an issue. Um, one said the excessive salivation is another pleasant side effect as I suffer from dry mouth much of the time. So even though there are side effects, uh, people are reporting that these were manageable or not uh, sufficiently bothersome to prevent them uh, from using this. Okay. Um, so kind of running of time here, um, but maybe we can some questions uh, more about 
um, my research towards the end. And uh, with that, uh, thank you for listening to my portion of the panel. And I would like to uh, now turn over the uh, to Giorgio uh, Samarini. Hi. Sorry, I'm having a, some, there we go. Okay. Hi. Good morning there and good, good evening here in Europe. A lot of discussions involved mushroom fry agaric in the past century in its archaeology, geography, biochemistry, and pharmacological aspects. Here, I focalize the zooming and exposing some updating data. Concerning the aspects of the Eurasian territory, we have various credible comments that could refer to an ancient use of fly agaric among different cultures. I recall the petroglyphs of the Pectimal River of the east of Siberia, dated like to the second half of the second millennium. Anthropomorphic figures, mainly Passion over the head, or man made a mushroom like head. The certainty that this mushroom like refer precisely to fly agaric comes from strong correspondence with the ethnographic data of the use of this mushroom. In Koryax, Chakchis, and other Siberian population. It is a known fact that Soviet ethnographers of the period 1940-1980 claimed with a sense of victory that the use of fly agaric among the Siberian populations totally disappeared. Now we know that this is not totally true. But what emerged from the observation of Russian documents that I have now in my hands and translating from Russia show a history of the Stalin persecution of shamans and and terrible and sad of what before supposed. Stalin has been direct responsible for the disappearing of thousands and thousands of Current ethnographic data, and not only the Salzmas ones, but also and firstly, those from the Russian ethnographers, evidence residual but also revitalized the use of flag among overall the Koryaks and the Kanti's ethnic groups. As you may see from this 16 uh, image. Fly Agaric played a role in the Moscow intellectual and that vanguard during the decade just, just before the of the state power, as we may observe, for example, from this that one of the symbols of this intellectual political pressure. This is a very famous painting during the 18 of the Soviet period in Russia. Okay. Here are some other archaeological documents from Eurasia. 
Title interpretation as flyaric documents does not be classroom like shape alone. Generally, this sample future is not enough to justify an ethnomarchological hypothesis. We claim that ethnographic correspondence or some graphical detail like the dots over the camp and of the presence of a ring around the objects. The details may be considered as killer details. That is, details that kill any inter inter interpretive doubt. I present one of the ethnological killer details. Thought it does not pertain to Eric, but to another species of hallucination. This find belongs to my research in the Sahara Desert, studying the painting of Tassili. In one of these paintings, it is possible to observe anthropomorphs with horns, with a mask, dancing and holding a mushroom-like object. The killer detail here concerns the two dot lines starting from the mushroom and reaching the head of the anthropomorphs. Just to under of the mushrooms of the human mind. So, okay. One new exceptional archaeological datum belong, belongs from Italy. In the dental cargoes of a skeleton corresponding to a 15 year old guy, Mashima has been detected. To my knowledge, this is a in the world of the of this fly agaric or cancer alkaloids in an archaeological find. Who asked to the America? Concerning the archaeology of the Americas, still we have very few documents, too, too much few documents that may be associ associated to fly agaric some degree of credibility like these two ones i for me only these two ones uh, in a, with a certain degree of credibility they both belong from mexican cultures in both cases the presence of the dots over the cap justify the yeah. ethnomycological interpretation the first one on the left, the possibility to have in my hands given to me by the late Gaston Gasman, really recall a baby of Fray Agaric, just in the process of being born from the regional Ovul. And the dots on the cap and the ring around the stipe, the egg like shape is the third graphical detail that strengthens. The a more weak interpretation as flagaric representation concerns this object that I present in red color to Mayan causes. Starting from the 1970s, this problem generated discussion among the Mayans still unresolved, swinging from flyagaric to raptor or fan interpretation. Personally, I consider it a weak the interpretation as flyagaric. And sometimes somebody wants to recognize flyagaric represented in South American archeo archaeological finds, not considering that this mushroom 
was not present in the pre-Hispanic times in this territory. Its current presence, like in Colombia and in Brazil, is due to more operations of pine trees from Europe and North America. So stop looking for Fry Agaric in archaeological finding in South America. Concerning the current American ethnographical aspects, we have to consider that it, in many cases, the use of flagari in religious rite still is a closely guarded secret. Here, I'm resuming our knowledge, including also a North Californian datum, which generally escaped to the attention of the and which refers to the religious use of Panzer Cap by the Hajumavi people that called this mushroom Polki. Concerning the dog grip Athabascan finding that has been reported also by Schultz and Hoffman in their book Plants of the Gods, I look at for original document and uh, consider it, it a very doubtful uh, datum because it belongs from an obscure New Age book of the 1976, where there are no ethnographical data of the dog and where also is not reported a traditional name eventually used in Athabasca. So I, I consider very doubtful this data. Now, I a problem still remains unresolved, enigmatic, very things that curious, curious behavior of the flies attracted by fly agaric. It is known that the flies from the cap of fly agaric fall on the ground apparently dead. And most people believe they really die. But few attentive observers know the reality. Flies don't die. Already in 1772, the Slovenian botanist Giovanni Scopoli said that flies don't die. And me too, from my many observations, I verified flies don't die. In the few, in reality, very few laboratory, mainly French research, it has been observed that flies die. They died for the hard laboratory conditions, but in nature, they don't die. Resting and licking the surface of the fly agaric cap, and I verify they really lick the surface, part of the flies, not all of the flies, start trembling, manifest a coordinated flight, and 20 minutes, many of them fall upside, upside down and stop any microscopic movement, but not the microscopic one. After a lapse of time, between 30 minutes till 50 hours, the fly recover. Why this happens, still we don't know. And if we still don't know, it's due to the fact that so far we have not developed the right research. Or we really kill the flies in the hard laboratory conditions, or we wrongly look for flaccidal compounds in the biochemical analysis of fly agaric, that is, compounds that kill the flies. Why? What we have to look for 
are the flight attractive compounds. And giving huge quantity of a fly attractive compounds to flies, verifying they die, and therefore concluding that the compound is fly that is a compound that kills the flies. This is a not the correct manner doing research. Why fly agaric attract flies, we still don't know. But we may suppose that there is a biological benefit from the mushrooms. Many years ago, I offered an hypothesis that the behavior of flies on fly agaric has to do with the behavior of looking for an eye, a behavior that is recognized, present, among various animal species, from insects to mammals, thought we still don't know its biological reason. It is important to observe that not all the flies leaking on fly agaric fall like that, and that could be seen as the most extreme reaction of a more general behavior of getting high on different degrees. Now, following this problem, I discovered an anecdotal fact of which I had personally been victim when I was young. One day, after collecting around 100 of fly agaric caps for research purpose, I was proceeding to the operation of cutting off the lamella to facilitate the drying process of the caps. And just for this, my hand was subjected to prolonged contact with the upper surface of the caps. At a certain point, I started to see the symptoms of a physical intoxication, trembling and sweating an intoxication that lasted for 40-50 minutes, luckily not so hard, and that I recall mascarinic intoxication. Now, in this image, I resumed what we know of the psychoactive alkaloids the isosexual swamp, ibotenic acid and mashimol, in the different parts of the mushroom get from an average calculation of around 22 biochemical analysis. No matter here the degree of concentration, it's not important here. What is important here is to observe is that quite all the different parts of the mushrooms have been checked. Why? Concerning the presence of the mascarine, the low quantity of mascarine, at least, at least knowledge, yeah. what part of the mushroom contains it. Therefore, there is a part of the mushroom that, at least to my knowledge, so far has not subject to the biochemical analysis. But The dots, that is, the veil remains, and more generally, the veil covers the original ovule from which the mushroom develop. The mascarinic intoxication of which I was victim due to the contact of the cap surface with my hand led to that, that mascarine is concentrated the dots in the veil remains. The rumors that, I, that, some, that sometimes I heard of the necessity to take off the film of the cap before eating the mushroom, an operation that avoid also the intake of the veil remains, could have a reason. And we could suspect of what is inside the very remains of the dots in the of the flies attracted by fly agaric. 
That's why, in my opinion, is urgent to develop biochemical analysis specifically on the veil, on the dots of fly agaric. We could discover something new. Okay, thank you very much, Giorgio, for your presentation. And uh, now we can uh, open it up to questions. <clears throat> so we do uh, have a few here, and I encourage people um, to go over to the Q&A. And uh, if you have questions for anyone specific or just general questions, uh, please uh, put them uh, over there. And so we'll start with, with this one. Uh, the question is, what indigenous groups, tribes use this mushroom? So I'll, I'll put this out there for, for anyone to answer. So uh, Giorgio, I don't know if you want to, to take on that question or. Okay. Um, so we do know uh, that there are um, tribes in Siberia and really the only ethnographic, uh, really the only solid ethnographic uh, evidence we have of traditional use comes out of Siberia. So some of the groups uh, are the Koryak and the Conti, um, the Evan tribe, uh, I believe the, the Ostiak. Uh, and there some are, and there are some others, and I I may have uh, repeated some because there are different names uh, for the same groups, um, but mostly we see that in in Siberia, and um, so that can be far apart in the Kamchatka Peninsula, uh, which is on the far end uh, on the Pacific and close to Alaska, and then there are also Siberian groups that are more inland that also have traditions. Okay, uh, let's see. So one of the questions was whether anybody here has direct experience making tinctures from fly agaric. I'd like to, to add the thing, Kevin. Do you yes. hear me? Yes, okay. Yes. Concerning the, concerning the effects of fly agaric, there is a lot of uh, discussion of uh, contradictions and also this fact that fly agaric is not psychedelic because it has a only only a effect that is observing the economy uh, of uh, of fly agaric but considering the anecdotes of a personal experience and the ethnographical data and knowing that is, I know what I recognize the psychedelic of a plant observing its ethnographical data. And uh, to me, the ethnographic correspond perfectly to a, a visionary to a visionary plan. So saying this is not a true psychedelic, well, we could discuss what is psychedelic before telling, no? But generally the ethnographical data for me correspond very well. And also my personal experience with Fray Agaric, let me consider it one. Uh, in the field of psychedelic effects, because we have various uh, kinds of psychedelic effects, but fly agaric, when I heard, when I heard him, him like <laughs> it, okay, um, for me it was a psychedelic source. Okay, this is my... Okay, perfect. Um, okay, uh, so there's a question on uh, research on toxicity and and maximum uh, dosage. Um, so I wonder if either of you have anything to say ab about 
uh, toxicity or uh, potential dangers with the with the unique pharmacology of your mushroom. And maybe I will say a few words about that. Uh, according to my knowledge, uh, there is no evidence that uh, um, after injection of uh, Amanita muscaria, you can die. <laughs> Uh, I think there is maybe one uh, literature data when um, one guy eat, I think, a dozen of, of fly agarics. So, um, so maybe after that uh, amount of mushrooms, which are considering uh, as ge uh, generally as uh, really um, hard to digest in our system maybe it was the reason why th that guy died <laughs> but i think it was not uh, after the um, eating of the dose of of the active components but maybe i'm wrong but i think uh, when you are reading the literature about uh, people who uh, were hospit hospitalized after in injection of, of, uh, of fly agaric, uh, they have only, you know, the, 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 the reason why they were hospitalized because they uh, realized that it was fly agaric and as Kevin said, it is considered as a toxic or dead so after people realize that they eat such uh, mm, mushroom, they uh, start to panic, and that's why perhaps they were hospitalized. So, so this is the the reason. But I I don't know the really um, there is no data current data about that fatal uh, in injection of of fly agaric. So. I would like to, to yeah to yes, it is a, an Italian fact of the of the past uh, last last years of the 18th century when uh, happened a problem over all of the Europe the philosopher arrived and killed all the wine plant the the, the plans to do 10 years, no wine in, in Italy, in France, in Europe. And Battista Grassi, a doctor from North Italy, looked for a substitute for wine to give to the population, because the population without wine in Italy has been a, a big problem. He observed he made a lot of research, starting giving to dogs and after to many people, and he arrived to conclusion that fly yeah. was a good substitute for wine, and started his in his pharmacy to sell pills of fly substitute with this function function substitute of wine. This is a curious aspect of. That's an interesting, interesting history. I'd love to know uh, more about that. Um, so one of the next questions uh, that we have is in a lot of the literature, there are warnings about the extreme variation uh, in the, the chemistry of the mushroom. And people say you can have two mushrooms right next to each other and one will have a give you a full blown experience and the other won't do anything. So the question is, uh, have have any of us observed uh, this? And, and if so, what factors uh, do you think might contribute to, to this uh, supposed variation uh, that's reported? Uh, I think it might be connected with the, um, um, how uh, how long uh, it is after you observe the fruiting body because sometimes you have uh, an old one and a quite a fresh one so if you pick up the old one which were uh, exposed for uh, for a sun for example then the level of active co component ma uh, may be uh, much lower than in the fresh one so i think it is 
that uh, observation or maybe other, but I know that uh, mm, mm, the main variation is connected with, with, with that, that if you pick up the old one uh, fruiting body, in that uh, kind of mushroom, you observe a lower um, uh, concentration of active uh, comp components. And, and I think there's a, sometimes a tendency to see the, the large dinner plate sized mushroom and, and just wonder at how impressive it is. Um, and even though that it's impressive looking, it doesn't necessarily speak to its its potency, as as Eva points out. Um, okay, so another a question is, uh, why is there barely any research on fly agaric or its alkaloids uh, within this kind of ongoing psychedelic renaissance that we are experiencing? Um, I must confess, uh, according to my experience with uh, isolation of of uh, active components of uh, fly agaric it, it is that uh, it is so uh, rich in many uh, compounds which uh, um, are connected to um, some activity maybe not activity but um, when i compare for example uh, um, Panther cup and fly agaric. When I was conducting my experiments, uh, and I just did a screen um, thin layer chromatography, um, and after re resolving that, uh, I, I see the difference between uh, num numbers of of compounds in uh, fly agaric extract in, for, and for example, panther cup. Uh, and also, I did some extraction from, from uh, uh, from other mushrooms, uh, uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms. Uh, so, in the um, Amanita muscaria, there was uh, much more compounds. So, it is very complicated and very hard to uh, to select and. Uh, isolate uh, a single one uh, compound. So I think it is the reason that it is not so popular in uh, to do the research because it is really, really uh, for, for uh, in, in the laboratory uh, and for chemists, it is a uh, really, really hard work to work with that kind of matrix that you have a really complicated mixture of co of compounds which, which have a really similar, uh, which were which which are quite similar to each other, uh, so it is really uh, hard to to separate them. Okay. Uh, so the next question is: Are the, are the active ingredients reduced substantially when the mushrooms are dried at low temperature and used later? Uh, so when you are drying uh, fly agaric, uh, there is a decomposition uh, from uh, ibotanic acid to muscimol. And it is good because uh, as we already said, the muscimol is uh, the main active component. So if you dry it in the low temperature, then you receive the um, mushroom with high content of muscimol. So it is for, um, for having that effect, uh, it is good to, to dry it like that. Okay. Um, another question is, uh, are there any authors or refer references uh, that you would recommend regarding uh, Druids and Alpine Celtic traditions with Fly Agaric? So I, I would jump in and say that the, the book that we'd all <laughs> uh, contributed to has several uh, chapters on, on Celtic traditions. Um, there's one by 
uh, Aaron Laurie and Timothy White uh, that goes quite in depth. Um, there's another by uh, Tom Ridlinger that goes into the uh, mythology around Cuchuland. Uh, and another chapter by uh, Peter McCoy, uh, who's involved in the radical mycology movement uh, that focuses on, on possible connections uh, with uh, the saint and, and goddess Bridget. Uh, so there are, are several chapters in the book that look at uh, Celtic traditions, and part of those discussions include uh, examining the Druids. Uh, so that would be one place to look. Uh, there's also a book uh, called uh, Plowing the Clouds, the Search for Irish Soma, um, and the name of the author uh, escapes me at the moment. Um, uh, Peter Lamborn Wilson. I think was the author of that. Um, let's see. There are also various German books on Flyadaric, but in German language, also in Catalan. This is the problem is that there are difficult languages, but there are books. Yeah, and, and this is one of the difficulties that I've encountered also uh, that uh, my own language abilities are fairly limited, and I, I know there are just lots of fantastic resources on, on this mushroom, but they're not uh, in, in English. Um, let's see. So there was a question on consuming fly agaric for, for therapeutic purposes. Is it something that has an immediate effect or relief, or do you have to consume it over time? to feel the effects. So I don't know if either of you have any thoughts. You know, I don't have uh, my own uh, reflection on that because I um, uh, I didn't consume it in like that. So, <laughs> so from my uh, own experimentation, I don't have that kind of uh, reflections. Um, I, go ahead, Georgia. No, uh, I know some Italian that, uh, that is, is an, an a doctor eh, on this, that uh, is using flyagaric in for microdosing, in a mm -hmm. microdosing technique, no? Because now is a, a, a fashion using microdosing try also with flyagaric, but I only heard this, I don't know how uh, the results, and I don't, I don't know this. Hmm. Uh, I, I think it probably depends on, on the purpose of the use. Uh, so I know there are people that have, you know, chronic uh, conditions uh, where they will use it uh, daily in, in kind of a, maybe not a microdose manner, but in, in small uh, doses. Um, so to manage symptoms of that chronic condition, uh, you know, such as, um, either fatigue or, um, uh, cognitive difficulties with, uh, resulting from Lyme disease, um, and people using it topically, you know, if, if that's a chronic issue, then they would use it on, on a fairly regular basis. The, so the relief can be, you know, immediate or, or fairly immediate. Um, but a lot of the uses for the mushroom are, are for things that would need to be treated kind of over time. Uh, so for example, something like uh, addiction is, you know, treating substance dependence is, is not something you can do uh, overnight. Uh, so that's probably something that, that people have done over a period of time. Uh, so we are just about a t out of time. Um, I want to thank everybody for your questions. I'm sorry we did not get to all of them. Um, I also want to thank uh, Eva and Giorgio for sharing your research and your experiences with us. And just quickly, um, for each of you, I'm just wondering if you might share a little bit about uh, how people might find out more about your, your own research. Um, okay, so maybe I will uh, give you an uh, email to me and I will type it in the chat box. So I will do it now. Okay, that's 
Well, that's perfect. That's a very easy way to do that. Okay. <laughs> perfect. Uh, wonderful. Um, and of course, I have to I have to put one more uh, plug for the book. It's uh, I think it's a great resource. Um, both Eva and Giorgio have uh, fantastic chapters. Uh, if you are interested in understanding more about the pharmacology of this mushroom, mushroom or of the uh, history and, and archaeology, um, uh, Giorgio has a great, uh, I think he, he cuts right through uh, a lot of the nonsense. Um, uh, of course, for those that are interested in more sort of speculative uh, explorations of the history of the mushroom, uh, the book has that as well. Um, anyway, thank you all uh, for being here. I, I hope uh, this will not be such a rare topic uh, in future conferences. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank it you. was very, it was good pleasure for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva. Bye. Bye. Bye.